Hi, everyone. It's Mark Thurman with the MIT Connected Things Conference. As you know, in 2020, we uh, originally scheduled the conference to be in March, March 23rd, I believe it was. Then it was postponed because of COVID to September. And as you've probably heard, it's also been canceled for this year. So what we've been doing a lot of is discussions like the one we're about to have today uh, in order to keep the conversation going. Connected Things is part of the MIT Enterprise Forum. The Enterprise Forum was founded in 1978. And as I understand it, that makes it one of the oldest entrepreneurial support organizations in the world. I'm really pleased that we have two excellent speakers today. Mac is reprising his role from 2017 when he talked a little bit about cognitive computing and IoT. Uh, and of course, he had that great phrase, it's all about the data, which uh, you may have been prescient on. Uh, and then Naeem Altaf is going to talk a little bit more about space, which is a, a topic that I'm very interested in and actually links in to some of the things we've got upcoming, some of the upcoming uh, MIT Enterprise Forum programs. So with that, I want to thank you both for coming. Uh, we'll start with Mac, just a quick hello, quick intro, and then uh, maybe update us a little bit on what IBM is doing in the cognitive computing space for a minute. But I'm very eager to get to the this whole discussion about what IBM is doing in space. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So, so my name is Mac Devine. I'm the IBM fellow uh, around our Cloud Native Center of Competency. I'm also the partnership executive for a uh, relationship with MIT. Uh, and in that context, I came uh, to uh, the internet of uh, the, the IoT uh, conference there. Uh, in, uh, at MIT in 2017, I talked about the rise of the cognitive machine because what I wanted to do was blend the world of cognitive computing and what was happening in IoT because I felt strongly that what was going to happen, you were going to see intelligence move out to the edge. And indeed, over the last three plus years, you've seen this rise in edge compute. Uh, with the 5G rollout, I think that's just going to accelerate even more. And so one of the things that I asked Naeem to do, who leads all of my uh, innovation team, uh, is to look at space technology, because space technology, if you look at some of the use cases that Naeem's going to talk about, they really stretch traditional IT beyond what it's capable of doing. The traditional centralized batch oriented kind of data analytics model, it's just not going to work. You need autonomous systems. You need to be able to act independently of back end systems. Uh, you've got great distances and great numbers and volume uh, in, involved here with these uh, space uh, tech use cases. And so I think it's very important for us to look at how we can move from that centralized kind of batch oriented data analytics world to a decentralized real time analytics world and meet some of the challenges that are ahead of us. And I think space technology is a great place to kind of cut our teeth on exploring new things, new technologies, new ways of doing things. And then what you'll see is the things that are kind of growing up in the, the space technology space will find its way back into some of the, the more mainstream uh, industry verticals. So that's what I want uh, Naeem to be able to talk to the audience about. I was really hoping you, you were going to say space the final frontier, but <laughs> maybe I'm well, putting a vintage well, on myself. Yeah, I, didn't to, I didn't want to steal Naeem's thunder. He's got a great was that, tagline. Was that your me. first line? <laughs> We, we, we have a new phrase now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Well, Mac, yeah. thanks for that. And you and I will be back and we'll, we'll be kind of uh, uh, leading some Q&A perhaps in a reverse panel or however you, however you want to phrase it. But Naeem, I want to welcome you again to, uh, to Connected Things. And um, I'm very eager to see what, what IBM's doing in space. I can't think of a more rugged environment. You know, again, I'll, I'll shut up in a second. But we, in, in IoT, we talk about very rugged environments like oil fields, where you've got you know, strange temperatures, both very hot, very cold, uh, remote uh, computing, you know, again, uh, oil fields and mining and things like that. But you've got the aspect of the vertical that I've not ever had a conversation about. So I'm really eager to hear about this. So Naeem, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for having us. Uh, so my name is Naeem Altaf. I'm a distinguished engineer and chief technology officer for Space Tech. Uh, <clears throat> so today, uh, you know, uh, like Ma uh, Mac was saying, right? So our tagline for the Space Tech is that sky is not the limit <laughs> anymore. That's what our tagline is. So we start with that. 
So if you look in the space, the space is no longer confined to the government agencies like NASA, European Space Agency, military and their contractors. Uh, it's expanding rapidly and a lot of thanks to you know, SpaceX, what they have done in the last decade or so. So this uh, entrepreneurial space age is, is going to change the course of human history. So again, looking at the technical advancements which are happening in the space sector, where you see these, uh, how uh, SpaceX brings the rockets back. Now, the first time when we saw, I think three, four years ago, it looked like a movie, it didn't look real. But now they have almost perfected that, the landing, with almost every space flight they do. And then they, we are also looking at this uh, paradigm shift in the industry, where you, before you saw only NASA doing end-to-end. -end. Now NASA is reaching out to SpaceX, and we last month when we saw the first human flight on a commercial flight, right, went to the space station. So these partnerships are opening up a whole new world of space economy. And as they say, right, the democratized access to space. And that's where we are looking at. Yep. No, I think it makes sense. Again, we want to go through some of the yes. uh, topics that we'd agreed on, but uh, it's interesting, you know, again, we're, we're, we're at the point where we're no longer watching the SpaceX uh, thing come back to earth. We've seen it already. It's, it's, exactly. you know, it, it's, it, it's, it, you know, I, I remember as a, as a kid being glued to the television, watching these early, you know, NASA space launches. Now we're hearing about uh, Virgin, uh, you know, whatever th that. Uh, yes, thing is. yes. Yes. You know, it's yes. sort of, uh, you know, creating space passengers. So mm -hmm. where does IBM fit in? And, and sure. of course, my other question will be at some point, how do you connect to all this stuff? So, <laughs> Awesome. So IBM, as you know, has a long history with NASA, right? Starting from all the Apollo missions, and then they were also using the mainframes you know, in the space shuttle era. And so IBM has always been involved with NASA and space. Mostly, probably we can say in the background, but now with this commercialization, our goal was how can we in the front so we can work with these companies. So the areas which we started to focus on we started with uh, blockchain technologies. So blockchain makes a perfect sense in this, in this very complex industry. So we can look at the space cargo, satellite manufacturing, the, uh, the, all the logistics behind this. Just today, this morning, the Mars rover, Perseverance, which went up right to the Mars. Mm -hmm. There are more than three countries involved and the equipment coming from all these different partners. Now this is where blockchain really shines, right? The, cross transparency and provenance with all the logistics involved in doing the assembly of these testing of these components and then putting them, integrating them, taking, uh, transporting them to a launch site and then a third party rocket taking it up. So you can see end to end how many different parties are involved, but then the insurance companies, then the regulatory bodies. So this is where, you know, blockchain can really shine in the space industry. And then, uh, this recently Artemis program, which is finalized now, going back to the moon. This is creating a whole ecosystem of these uh, different kinds of companies in the space industry. So you, if you look at that uh, traditional asset management, now if you do the same asset management in the, uh, space, in the space industry, first of all, it's extremely complex, very expensive uh, components used, and this is where you know, tracing everything from all the way from the from the uh, buying those parts to manufacturing and you know uh, assembling and everything, this is where blockchain will play a huge role. The uh, second area is the edge computing, and edge computing. This is where you know the questions you're asking about IoT, remote sensing, edge computing. These all things come together. So let's think of an easy use case of edge computing. Majority of your satellites in the lower Earth orbit. What they're doing, they're doing these Earth observation. So they are scanning the globe. And before you used to have these very expensive satellites, which can cost up to half billion dollar. Now you have satellites which are small sets. They can cost up to between one to $4 million and they can do the same job. And then you have a whole category of cube sets, nano sets, which college students been sending and you can build them for less than 100K. The only high cost is the launch cost but the building a CubeSat itself is very cheap now. So what these CubeSats or different uh, variety of these uh, satellites, what they are doing, 
they are doing earth observation they are collecting massive amount of data but 80 percent of that data when they are taking the pictures earth is cloud covered so that data is it's totally i mean you can't use that data and the downlink from the satellites to the ground is a very expensive process in terms of speed it's extremely slow so you want to only bring data down which is meaningful and this is where we can use the concept of tiny ml right we can have these ai models which we can push down to these edge devices being the satellites in the orbit and we can say you know do your inferencing find only the actionable data and only send me that don't send me the whole stuff right so this is i think one example of uh, the edge computing which can be used then uh, and then in the future what starlink is doing as you know putting these you know pizza boxes everywhere they have now up to i think 5 or 600 now and they plan to go to 12000 to provide the internet access to the from the from the leo to the ground right. and the speeds they talk about is 1 gig so maybe in future they will open up that to the objects in the orbit so they can piggyback on that network and leverage that one gig speed. I think that is a, that will be a game changer in the future. I'll just kind of interject just to, you know, to, to keep it uh, what so I don't forget, I guess. So yeah. when you talked about blockchain, you know, blockchain yeah. and IoT, you know, there, there's been, there was an early linkage of the two technologies. I don't know if that was the conference Mac that you presented in or the one after, but we actually had a point counterpoint panel with uh, uh, an MIT uh, Media Lab guy and a guy from SAP, as it turns out, kind of uh, pro con pros and cons on on blockchain. The cons were around uh, the massive amount of energy usage, uh, you know, around uh, generating uh, all the various things necessary there, and the ability to overwhelm. Uh, uh, blockchains from a security standpoint. Again, that's more on the transactional side, but I'm curious, and I know IBM's had a stake in, in, in sort of moving the blockchain technology forward. How, how does that apply in the, in the space world, if you will? Sure. And, and the term space world, of course, are, are mutually exclusive, but. <laughs> exactly, yes. So I think the, the concept of, <laughs> so the Sorry. concept of remote sensing, that comes in the picture. So let's say we take remote sensing from satellites and the blockchain technologies on the ground. And uh, we are looking at optimizing the supply chain in a variety of industries in context of COVID-19 pandemic. So imagine once the vaccine will be available, let's say hopefully sooner, but you know, in the next six months, yes. imagine the space, uh, the supply chain logistics in planning, distribution, scale, we are talking about, I think, several billion of these vaccines, which will need to be distributed. This is where the sensors on the ground, you know, remote sensing and the blockchain tracking everything. I think these things, things will come together. So that's yeah, tracking so the like provenance. Yeah, so remark on the, the, the when you look at uh, blockchain, the more critical the cargo, the more valuable the cargo, uh, the more valuable the parts that are flowing through the supply chain, the more you want to make sure that things get to where they are supposed to at, at that point in time. In the early days of blockchain, people were utilizing blockchain, trying to use it as more of a decentralized database. And they ran into all kinds of trouble in terms of, of performance and scale. But if you use it as an immutable ledger, where you make sure that you have a digital record of how things are flowing and that you have the right digital checkpoints in place, then it becomes a significant tool to to ensure that you don't have a uh, loss due to the being buried in people, paper, and process, the three Ps that I talked about in 2017. That's right. Well, you know, in asset tracking for pharmaceuticals, I think Naeem's example is a, a really valid one. You want to know, you know, did the thing stay within its, its tolerances, which is a classic IoT asset tracking use case. Did it stay between this temperature and that temperature? How long has it been wherever? Was there a, a security breach long, along the way that would... Uh, ruin the medications. Um, so I think, Naeem, by extension, you, you've been saying that using the, the linkage to uh, objects uh, in space is, yes. is providing greater fidelity from a tracking standpoint as well. Exactly. Like, for example, uh, Planet, which is a leading company in Earth observation satellites, they just announced two weeks ago that their latest uh, constellation of satellites can give you a 50 centimeter resolution. Wow. 50 centimeter. I mean, if you guys remember 20 years ago, 
the movie which came from Will Smith, where they can use the satellites to watch what's, you know, where you are, what's happening. Today, it's a reality now. So imagine if you have that kind of imagery and, they, and these are constellations, they can scan the whole globe in two days. In wow. two days, you have a full mapping of the globe. So just imagine, right, you are being washed from the top, you have sensors on the ground, and then like Max said, right, the immutability and prominence aspect, tracking everything, it makes it a very solid case. I could see use cases in, in agriculture, you know, mapping, you know, especially with the two day turnaround, you know, mapping uh, areas for drought or, or other weather related right. issues. And I think yeah, uh, it's Mac, you, you mentioned that because the Extreme Blue project that Naeem is doing with the University of Stanford is on precision agriculture. Oh, interesting. They use the precision agriculture and space together. So. And mm -hmm. I think in your talk, Mac, you talked about how, uh, or it might have been in our podcast how IBM purchased the weather company, which seems to be a really interesting source of data, especially in the agricultural world. Correct. In fact, one of the early projects that Naeem and the team did with uh, the NASA Frontier Development Lab was a project a couple years ago, Space Weather Meets Earth Weather, um, because wow. uh, the, uh, the weather events in space really have a significant impact on the weather events uh, on, on our planet. So. Um, so yeah, so that's a, that's a really great source of, of data and information and the fact that people are willing to share weather data, um, it gives us a, a very dense view of what's happening in the world. Um, and uh, with the work that NASA is doing with Naeem's team, we also had a view of what was happening in space and how the two interacted with one another. So I think, you know, kind of pursuant to that, you know, and I'm looking at our, our list of topics, how do you keep these things from bumping into each other? There's got to be a lot of junk up there. Exactly. So yes, that's a, that's a very hot topic in the space industry. And that's what's called uh, space debris. And you will hear these different terms, uh, space debris, space traffic management, space situational awareness. They are all sort of kind of interconnected. So let's take example of uh, what's happening in the space right now. So to date, uh, we have launched like 9,000 objects. In, into the lower, we aren't talking about lower Earth orbit for now. And then there are 5,000 of the satellites which are active, which we know of in last 60 to 70 years. In next two to three years, they're talking about more than 20 to 30,000 satellites oh. will be in the orbit. Wow. And, and right now, and, and this is because of all these internet providers like SpaceX and the Blue Origin wants to do their Kuiper project, OneWeb, and more companies are emerging. The, the, the challenge in this orbit right now is, it's like uh, there are this bunch of highways and there is no rule. So you can just drive whichever way, whatever you want to do. Nobody's going to stop you, right? right. And then there are bad actors and there's different things are happening. And I think you should, uh, there's a very nice article which just came, I think this week, where they called the, uh, one of the country's satellite, these Russian doll satellite. I saw that actually. I was going to ask about it because one satellite yes. emerged from inside of another. <laughs> just, just imagine that, right? So, so, you, so you have your satellites doing certain function and then another country has their satellite which is watching your satellite and then that satellite produces two more satellites and then they, you have three of them watching, right? So yeah, I think this is a, this is a very, very hot topic. And what we need is a better identification, tracking and sharing of information between these agencies. And we are in the process of working with different partners right now. And this will be based on blockchain. So where all these parties, because right now the data is in silo. And we, I can show you some models where, let's say for example, uh, I want to know a certain object and Russian space agency says, we have these kinds of orbits around the earth. And if I ask the US agency, it gives me a totally different picture. So if we have the same kind of information for flight tracker for the planes, that if I ask for a certain plane flight and it gives me three different flight pl uh, plans, right? right? It will be a disaster. So, so that's what's happening in the industry that you know, the, the data is not being shared. And there is a huge concern as more and more uh, you know, uh, objects are going into the space and the flights that we need to have better control and laws and, and better tracking. And one, uh, I will ask, uh, you know, recommend this uh, company, Leo, Leo Labs. And when, when you get a chance later on, take a look. They have, they, are, they have the most advanced visualization to date uh, about the stuff in, in, in the uh, orbit. And it is, it is full of debris. Interesting. Like, so for, 
for example, I mean, just the flight which went today up from the URL, all, all the first stage, second stage, third stage, they are just in the orbit. It's not like SpaceX that they bring stuff back. So most of these uh, things which goes up, they just leave stuff up there. So is there kind of given what you've said, is there sort of a neutral third party or clearinghouse for this data where the Russians or the whomever the you know, I don't, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. turn this into a political conversation, but you know, whichever, yes. whichever country has crap floating around, is there yes. a way to register all of these objects so that your junk doesn't hit my junk? N not yet. I mean, there, there is like a database available in every country, like US Air Force, they track through their radars and every agencies are doing, but there is no like, you know, one place where we can have a, some sort of a consolidation of data. Just in this year in January, uh, so European space agencies there, some, some very valuable, like very expensive satellite and the pizza box uh, from the Starlink, they were about to come uh, in the path. And so ESA sent an email to, Star, to, to the SpaceX guys saying, please remove from the path because we've been here longer than you and our <laughs> stuff is much more expensive than your you know, box. And they totally ignored it. And after three, four days, when it was coming closer, ESA had to maneuver their satellite. And then later on, SpaceX said, oh, we never saw your email, right? So first of all, we need this real-time <laughs> messaging system built where, right, again, if you have, this is where, again, blockchain from provenance point of view, where you can track the whole history. That's right. So all this messaging is coming through, right? So you can track, and then you have some body authority which can force these companies to do something. This is this is like space weather. This is a, a weather company uh, product offering. I don't know. We we have made cook, we may have just cooked up something new, not, <laughs> because it sounds. Like, I mean, it would be a really bad day if you're if one object hits the other object in space because yes. you've got no way to control it easily and quickly in in a in a real time manner for the most part. And the debris de debris one plus two will create more debris. Oh, and ho yes, so. That's, that's interesting. I think I was reading, what, two weeks ago, the uh, SpaceX, one of the guys on a, on a spacewalk lost a mirror from his glove or from his, his space suit. So there's some mirror floating around. Uh, and again, that's just part of the yes. infinite, infinite uh, junkyard that's floating above our heads. But mm -hmm. so um, what's the most interesting project you're working on? I mean, this is, again, you probably have probably one of the best jobs I've heard of uh, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after Max like, job, I'm sure, but of course, you know. of course, of course. <laughs> so the another project, uh, which, uh, like Mac mentioned, uh, we are working this summer is we're building this, uh, open cognitive autonomous framework and our, we are focused on the CubeSat swarm, but this framework will be open source on any swarm of XYZ objects it can be used for. So like, for example, the drones, Right, or robots. So the idea behind this, uh, this framework was, so like I mentioned earlier, that we have this uh, huge number of CubeSats coming in the future. Actually this weekend, the SmallSat uh, conference, which is the major conference of the smaller satellites will happen, start this uh, Saturday. So this, uh, these CubeSats and SmallSats and NanoSats, you will see a lot of them coming in the near future. I mean, that's the future. Instead of building these monolithic big, uh, satellites, you're building these smaller satellites. It has a short life, much cheaper, that does the job and done. It's like what we use the uh, analogy in, you know, in cloud, in the cloud native development as microservices right. and sidecars. So instead of building this monolithic projects, we are building very small ones. So now imagine, for example, we have a swarm of these, let's say a dozen of these, a swarm. And an event occurs that there's a big uh, hurricane coming. I think one of them is coming right now towards Florida. So a hurricane is coming and from the ground, I send a payload. I say, you know what, use a, a swarm. You have a task for next seven days to track this uh, hurricane and track every movement and learn about this. So once I send this uh, you know, request, now all of those uh, CubeSats are fully autonomous, fully independent, there is no single point of failure. So there is no like master or node and the, you know, the worker node. They all are totally independent. Now they automatically select who is the leader so they can, so they can figure it out what the logical grouping of these uh, CubeSats will be. And then they start acting on that payload request, which we said, you know, go and watch this hurricane. 
and they are adjusting, they are building these, uh, like I mentioned, the uh, clustering of these CubeSats. Everything is fully autonomous. They're automatically doing everything. And then at the end of the task, when that, when that event is finished, they send, we will have the reinforcement learning code on this CubeSat. And then we will only get whatever the insightful, you know, the insights, useful insights which you can get from that uh, event. So, so there's the idea. So Naeem, just so, so I get it. Yes. They're, they're dividing up the workload amongst themselves. Yes. They're selecting a, a, a group leader, if you will. It's, yes. you know, it's a situational leadership thing. They, mm -hmm. they divide up the compute tasks, again, yes. which is a great illustration of you know, edge computing as well. And then yes. at a certain point, they uh, reassemble the, uh, the, the information to one coherent piece. And then one, one of those things shifts it down to the ground. Did I get it right? Actually, actually all of them are able to do that. Interesting. Because, so, so to reduce that single point of failure. So, so we said any one of them, if let's say, like you said, the leader goes away then it's not dead. Any one of them can still communicate to the ground directly, but then we can find the most efficient ways who has the most bandwidth at a given time to downlink the data. So these are all the intelligent decisions which can be made among the cluster. Interesting. And this is done on the fly. And then they, after the event is over, they can deassemble and again, wait for another set of events. So distributed computing. Yep. So while they're, so while they're unassigned, what, do they yes. have a nominal task that they would be doing? Is it weather yes. collection or, or? So they have those typical sensors for the like a radiation sensor and they are looking for different events. So they are collecting all this telemetry data. So, and, and on top of that, doing the normal earth observation. Okay. So they are doing that. And in future, for example, today I sent a event to the, uh, to this uh, swarm, right? Tomorrow, the swarm has cameras and they are watching the globe. They can detect much more uh, earlier than me and then from there, pick on the task, instead of me telling them. Oh, it's, it's interesting. Now, um, I, I think I'll switch to Mac for a second. As I'm aware, and it's been in the news, you know, IBM's kind of gone through a bit of a pivot, and you guys are doing a lot uh, around the Red Hat acquisition. So I'd ask you to comment quickly on that, and then how does that play into some of the work that Naeem is describing? Yeah, so when you look at, um, going back to the example that Naeem just talked about, the importance of, of collective intelligence, coordination, uh, this swarm intelligence, uh, being able to, to have uh, an aggregate view, you know, in order for those things to happen, you have to have some foundational building blocks, and, and Linux is that foundational uh, operating system that uh, we, we build upon. And so a very important uh, aspect of what we did with uh, Red Hat is the incorporation of intelligence out into the Linux operating system into things like our OpenShift Kubernetes uh, framework. Uh, and so one of the things that Naeem's team is doing is kind of pushing the envelope of what can be done there. So taking a lot of things that kind of grew up in a Linux standpoint in a traditional enterprise data center and figuring out how to disassemble them and move them out to the edge and then have a collective intelligence from many endpoints versus having a central intelligence in one endpoint. So. That's, it, it, that's what prompted the question, quite frankly. I mean, it sounds really interesting. It sounds like it's enabled by this new uh, capability um, that, that you guys have announced. So it's, it's, it's like a cool use case. Um, it's probably the coolest use case. Again, you probably have one of the best jobs that I've heard of. Uh, and, you, <laughs> and you have a rocket over your right shoulder, which is really cool. Um, I may have instruments, but you've got something better. <laughs> so, so, you so, so, Mark, to, so Mark, to add to what Mac was saying, so other yes. the vision we have, so like we acquired Red Hat and one of their, uh, you know, leading platform, OpenShift platform. Our goal is that this OpenShift platform, like as we are expanding on the ground from the data centers, from the on-prem data centers to the edge, that we further take this platform into the space and this OpenShift platform becomes the platform of choice for this next generation of, we call them software-defined satellites. So for, for example, like, like you know well, right from the IoT point of view and the, and the edge computing, as a developer, if I'm building something in my office or in, in, in cloud, from there, it's a seamless integration between wherever this, uh, you know, my target is running on the OpenShift platform. Okay, Ooh, did I lose you? No, I'm here. Oh, you're there, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, 
the uh, connection kind of, this is the, the beauty of these Zoom calls is that they, uh, sometimes they freeze. So I apologize if, if I froze. Um, okay, yes. so go on. Yeah, so like I was mentioning, right, the, the, the goal here is to have the open shift platform extended from the edge computing happening on the ground to the edge computing happening in, in the space. So for the developers, it's a seamless experience and integration. Okay. And I do think, Mark, what you'll see is because of the cost being uh, significantly less with these uh, cube satellites, these nano satellites, et cetera, is you'll see enterprise companies looking at incorporating these kinds of technologies, drones, et cetera, into how they operate things on the ground, giving them a completely new perspective. Because you can see uh, where you have uh, an, uh, an earth, a space to earth observation with the pinpoint nature of what you can see in terms of imagery being able to have much more precision than what you can have on the ground because of the obstacles that exist on the ground. And so uh, I think you'll see kind of a reinvention, if you will, of, of what we do in terms of supply chain. Uh, like I said, and no one's seen that more than, than the United States over this COVID-19, the problems with supply chain. I mean, people were, you know, without toilet paper for months, you know. Or, or, they, couldn't, or they couldn't find the, uh, the breathing machines, yeah. Because, you know, the, the supply chain, the visibility of the supply chain is significantly limited. It's very static. It's very checkpoint to checkpoint. Uh, it's buried in people, paper, and process, the three Ps that I mentioned before. Right. And so being able to break yourself out of that and getting a completely new perspective in terms of what's really happening on the ground but getting that perspective from space is a significant move forward, in my opinion. And we're using the space tech industry uh, to, to prove some of these technologies out under Naeem's leadership. No, I think this, this sounds great. I know we're, we're starting to bump up, up against the edge of uh, the, the Zoom limit. So I'll, I'll um, maybe uh, kind of move to a quick wrap up of some of the things that you guys were saying. Um, IBM has been in space for a long, long time, which is a, forget, a fact I forgot. Um, from an IoT standpoint, the application of uh, traditional and kind of this new age set of uh, IoT technologies um, and new forms of communication using, you know, these nanosats, microsats, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting topic. I think we'll probably invite you guys back to do some more deeper dives on, on this very topic. But I, I guess, um, not only do I want to thank you both, but if there's a, a quick, you know, a 30 second hit from each of you on either the future with all of this or something we should kind of uh, keep an eye out for. So I, Naeem, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you the first, uh, the first shot at just a quick hit. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having us, right? So I think a short and brief message from my side is the, I think at the end, I think it's imperative that in such unprecedented times, we work together embrace these uh, stronger international cooperation to be this pandemic. That is the most you know, critical thing at the moment. Absolutely. And uh, our uh, you know, goal is that sky is not the limit. <laughs> he went back, he went, he, comedians call that the dipsy doodle when you go back to an old theme and then you, you drive it home. So I congratulate you for that. Mac? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to, you know, I was also going to talk about, you know, the pandemic. There's a, there's a unique window of opportunity here, in my opinion, why everybody's kind of focused on solving some of the issues that really were highlighted in this pandemic. Being able to use technology for good, being able to help uh, people, be able to help uh, things get better, uh, health care. Uh, and you saw, you might have saw last week, there was an announcement from the Linux Foundation the Linux Foundation for Public Health, which was the Linux community coming together to try to address some of the shortfalls that exist in terms of responding to uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so I think there's a unique opportunity for us to take some of these enabling technologies like edge compute, blockchain, et cetera, that are decentralized, that are autonomous, because I really think we're going to be entering uh, what I call the age of autonomy, where you have human robotic interaction and I hinted at this coming uh, when out in the 2017 presentation, the rise of the cognitive machines. What you really see now is that actually coming to reality. It was kind of more of a vision in 2017. It's really a reality now because you have uh, autonomous systems working together with people. And if we can do that in agriculture, we can 
solve things like the World Food uh, Program. We're working with them to look at how we can uh, attack world hunger utilizing technology. And so I think those are the kinds of projects that really resonate with developers. And, and if the tech companies like IBM, Microsoft, et cetera, can get behind those initiatives, we can see a significant move forward in terms of using technology for good. I think you're right. And uh, I'll thank you both. We're at our, the limit on our, on our 40 minute Zoom call. So I, I really appreciate uh, both of you doing this. Uh, thanks All right, again. Thanks, Mark.